So we have already seen how to use a random box in order to, well, usefully find collisions and then with the random box how to use a Floyd cycle finding method so that we don't have to invest a huge storage. So in the third lecture on discrete logs, we just went for this abstract picture where we saw the cycle forming and then we know that we have efficient methods to detect a cycle which means that we're running two walks, a fast and a slow one. Each does a step at each time and then for each step we compare the two values. So just for that step, not looking backwards uh, to see whether we have already found a collision or not. Uh, I have already announced a little bit how this can be useful. So to summarize everything, um, we're trying to, well, we want to use the Burster Paradox. We know that for a group of order n after square root of pi n over 2, so, well, roughly square root of n um, steps or random draws from the set, we will find a collision. Now, what I did on the pictures was just putting, like, random arrows everywhere. And now we want to do this in a way that is well related to the discrete log problem and efficiently computable. Paul's row method is a pretty general strategy, so you will also see this come back when we're talking about uh, factorization of integers, or we're going to see this uh, for something called hash functions in the next lectures. These are functions where, well, finding collisions is supposed to be hard, and they're mapping long strings to short strings. So for the discrete log problem, our task for today is that we find a function so that it, well, looks random, so pseudo-randomly samples function, but it has to be deterministic, so it has to really be pseudo-random, not random, so that when we use Floyd, I mean, it requires that when we're at the same spot, we do the same step again. And then we do want to have that the function gives us a meaningful result. And for that one, um, if we assume that we know that for every step, this wi is a known combination of the, well, the we have the discrete log challenge, so we have a base point P, and we have the discrete log challenge Q. So we're looking for A, which is, so that Q is A times P. Um, assuming that we know this uh, representation for each W, and then we find two different ways to get to the same point. So we're walking around and we're hitting the same point again. So we have been here and we come around after a circle, same spot. So now the first one we call wi, and the second one we call wj. So we've been here before, and now we have an aipbiq, and we have a ajpbjq. And if these are equal, well, we can sort things around. So moving the q's on one side, moving the p's on the other side, and then we get that a, well, we want to have everything as a multiple. Well, we want to have the part in front of the q come over to the p side, um, that we can do if bi minus bj is in virtual mod q. So the second part, design the step function so the collisions gives meaningful result. That works well, okay, it's meaningful if the GCD is 1, um, well, if n is a prime, that's definitely fine, and if the GCD is not 1, we can invert it, modulate the largest factor of n where it is prime, and then bootstrap from there. So this talk is about the first part how to design this function, how to get it such that for each wi we know these ai and bi. Now the first attempt is pretty plain, so here's a, just a repetition of what we're looking for. Um, for. This function has to depend on the representation of the point where we are, so it has to be a function in w. And what I'm going to do is I'm just going to pick ai and bi in terms of the previous w. So if I want to do the next step, I compute two functions, g of w and h of w, which give me an integer, well, somewhere within the group order. So n is the group order, so it's a number between 0 and n minus 1. And I use those two as a new scalars. So I'm getting my wi by taking ai from the previous, or g of the previous step, and the bi is the h of the previous step. There are lots of ways you could do this wrong. For instance, you could do just like the last bit, or you can have both functions be constants. You could have g equal to h. But for some sufficiently random functions, and they are different, then this looks like a random walk. OK, 
okay, user fantasy, how you would design those. Um, if we need to take the representation as an integer, and if p is actually smaller than n, or if it's larger than n, you would use it mod n, so you have some way of representing this. Okay. So you also need a starting point, and there you just pick two random numbers in that interval a0 and b0, and you set off. So now you compute your double zero, w0 from the w0, while you compute the g and the h of this, so it gives you the a1 and a2, and then that computes your w1. Now each of those steps costs you, well, at first it looks like it's two scalar multiplication, actually we call this sum of two scalar multiplications, we call a double scalar multiplication. And I'll show you in a moment that it's a little bit cheaper as a two separate multiplications, uh, scalar multiplications. But in any case, I mean, even two scalar multiplications wouldn't be outrageous. Now, then we know that after square root of pi n over two such steps, we should find a collision. And there's a small fudge factor extra, fudge factor extra because we're using the Floyd cycle finding but it's on the scale of square root of n double scalar multiplications. Okay, so each double scalar multiplication, can we, how can we do this? Now, when you remember how we did the double and add method, then for each bit of the scalar, so say of this aim, we're doing a doubling of a point, and if a bit is set, we're doing an addition. And then in the last lectures, I was very concerned about side channel attacks and so on. But here we're in attacker. Well, we're breaking things, so we don't have to worry about side channels. So we can just write if and else and have totally different uh, execution times, no matter what. So here we can do this um, double, and if it's if the bit is set, we add. And then we also at the piece at the Q side, we are also doubling, and if the bit of V is set, then we add Q. And so the idea of double exponentiation, or double scalar multiplication, is that we share the doublings, so we have initialized our, well, it was R in the algorithm, now call it W. Um, we initialize this at zero, and then we double. And if A0 is one, we add P. If B0 is one, we add Q. If both of them are one, well, you could add both separately, but we can even do a pre-computation of computing P plus Q. And then for each bit of the scalar, we have at most one addition. And then we take our result, we double it. Now we move on to the second bit. Inspect the bit of A, inspect the bit of B, add the uh, respective element there, and, well, double again, and so on. So we have half the number of doublings, and for the additions, well, we had 50-50 chance before, and now we have three quarters the chance, but of a half length. So it's, it's also gotten better there. So we saved one quarter of the additions. All right, this is actually not how we're doing it. This is called attempt one, because there will be attempt two. But it should show you that we have a solution. We have already established that it works. We're just haggling about the price. Okay, so when you're trying to figure out what you need in order to look random, and I don't mean like me waking up in the morning looking random, I mean kind of, uh, a mathematical form of randomness. So how can we co massage the functions so that, well, our baby step giant, sorry, our birthday paradox will still be sufficiently happy saying, okay, yeah, this is sufficiently random, or maybe we can just estimate how non-random it is and pay a small penalty in somewhat more executions to make each step cheaper. And by cheaper, I mean a lot cheaper. So what I'm going to show you is called an additive walk. And so for comparison, the previous one is doing a double scalar multiplication. This one will just do a single addition for each step. So to get from wi to wi plus 1, instead of doing a double scalar multiplication, we're doing one addition. So that's a lot cheaper. I was just talking for a minute to highlight, hey, we're saving a few of the additions and a lot of doublings. This brings it down to 1. All right, so what do we do? So we we coming up with, well, at each point in the previous, in the attempt one, we have, we can go anywhere. We have n elements, and we can go there. And it even looks like we're having like 
n squared directions because I mean like we're having n choices of a and n choices of b they're not even all this all different there are only n other elements so n squared is definitely overkill but as long as we're having sufficiently many other points we could land on this will probably be good enough and so what we normally do is we pick a smaller number and for computers well, we like working with something which are powers of 2, so we can just inspect some bits. So I'm taking 32 here, but if you're a human, you might prefer working with uh, multiples of 10, so you might want to have 10 or 20 pre-computed points. So some small number k of pre-computed steps. And a step, well, that is the same kind of thing that we've done so far. So these are double scalar multiplications, where here we're picking two random numbers, so cj and dj from the whole full interval of the group size so these are big steps this would be like one step from the wi but now it's a fixed step we're going that word additively it's not kind of multiply and so we pre-compute these sj so stayed on the slide there and then whenever we want to do a next step we pick one of those k different steps Okay, so, well, how do we select this? Remember, in order to have the Floyd cycle finding work, and in general, to have the collisions come up, we need that the step is deterministic. So for this w, we always have to do the, next, the same step next. So again, we need a function that takes the group elements and deterministically assigns it the next step. And in this case, all it does is it chooses the index. It picks one out of these 32 points depending on what the representation of w is like. Okay, and so we're doing w plus this pre-computed point, and then that's our next step. So we now have brought the cost down to just one addition. So typical choices, as mentioned already, that we like to have kind of binary things, so powers of two, and then for the this s function, what we like to do is we just inspect a few bits. So 32 is 2 to the 5, so we're looking at the last 5 bits of representation of w, and for that we want to have the affine x coordinate. So remember that for elliptic curves, uh, we had several representations, so we had just x and y. And we also went through, um, for constructive usage, that it would be nicer to work with projective coordinates, so with x, y, and z. But when you have x, y, and z, then you have redundancy. Remember that you had like x, y, z is the same as lambda x, lambda y, lambda z. And here we want to have the same step each time we come back. So we're working with unique representatives. And so that's why we want to have affine coordinates. And that's why we're using uh, Weierstrass curves in the explanations. So Weierstrass curves are good for attacks. Edwards curves are nice for constructive things. And well, the y coordinate adds only information about the sign, so by using the x-coordinate, we basically have the whole information. Okay, so that determines how we're doing the step, and then, well, we can now go ahead. Except for, well, how do we actually get back to what we needed? There was this requirement that for each step, right, there was a requirement too, that the collisions are meaningful, which we solve by saying we want to be able to write each w as a sum AP plus BQ. This is a relatively easy problem, so I think you have already thought about the solution. Namely, well, it's not that you get it explicitly stated, okay, well, here's your A and here's your B, but you can keep a tally, you can track off what um, numbers you have seen already. So you're starting at some um, starting point, so you're picking random A0 and B0, and you pick those so you know those, so you initialize. Uh, some value a with a0, some value b with b0. And then, well, when you do a step, when you pick this s sub lowercase s of w, well, that does pick, let me go back one slide, this does pick the right cj and dj. So if you're picking C, uh, s2, then you go and look up the step S2, you don't have to recompute it, it's there, you know this computation already. But you also remember what the C2 and the D2 were. And then you just use those to update A and you use those to update B. 
And then you go to the next point, you do compute the index of S, so that's the J, then you're adding S to W, and you're updating A, and you're updating B. Slide was full, but actually these updates are computed modular the group order. So our sizes for A and B don't grow outrageously. So that's always no larger than N. And well, if you let them grow outrageously, in the end you're computing the fraction of the AI minus AJ divided by BJ minus II, and that thing is computed mod N. So the mod N does come up. Next question is, well, I was saying, okay, we can't possibly have n squared directions or n directions, that seems excessive, but how large does k need to be for f to be grand? I mean, the worst case would be if you have something like square root of, of n again, because then we would be doing square root of n pre-computation here, and that would need square root of n storage, and the whole reason for doing polar row is to avoid the storage. Well, for this one, the answer is a formula, namely we will compute on the next slide, that there is something which we call anti-collisions. So if we have fewer steps, then we're having some delay in finding the collisions. So if we're only having k steps, then the running time, so the time till we find a collision, increases by 1 over 1 minus 1 over k. Okay, so if your k is 32, then it's instead of, well, factor 1 there, then you're having a factor of 1 minus square root of, okay, 31, 32. Um, that's a general approximation that you can do, so it's plus 164. So it's not too bad. But if you have only two steps, this would be pretty bad. Okay, so let's see what these anti collisions are. And let me say, start a pick up, uh, let, let me start, set up this, the scene here. Okay, so here we have a point which we hope to be our collision point. And we're coming in with two different walks, or from two different places. These are, like, remember on the game plan, uh, on the game board, assuming that those two have an arrow pointing there. And we're expecting a new collision. So we're expecting that W and W prime are random other points. They're somewhere and we hope to collide at t. Now, if they both happen to map to t in the same step, because it must be in the same step, else we won't detect it. So if both from w we get to si, and from w prime we get to si. Okay, what does it require? First of all, we have to get to t. So the, the first equation here is that both of these sum up to t. And if you take some random and w and some si, probably it won't be w, it won't be t. It will be some other point. And also for the w prime, that the sj that you're picking is actually the right one. So the fact that both of those map to the t, well, that has probability 1 over n for the first one, 1 over n for the second one, because they are n points and, well, it has a chance to pick any of them. Also, if that actually works, then we have to pick the correct i for w. I mean, it's nice to know that there is an si that maps me to t, so if I'm in this w, and this is actually the t, I can get there with si, but maybe I don't pick the right si, maybe I'm picking the wrong si. So picking the right si, well, there are k different steps. And also for w prime, I have to pick the right j, again, there are k different steps. So it's a pretty low probability. I mean, the biggest part here is the 1 over n squared, but also then the 1 over k and 1 over k are not enormous. Now, if we sum this over all possibilities, because, well, I mean, we are in these two points, but we have the chance over all the directions, because we're, we're counting for the probability of getting the right one with these 1 over k factors here, um, then, well, if w is not equal to w prime, also, it must hold that i is not the same as j, because, well, if we take two different points and we're adding a step in the same direction, they will still, well, they will be parallel to each other. They can't be colliding. So i must be different from j, and otherwise we can sum over all of those. 
Okay, so this sum, which is going for over all the i, j, assuming, well, provided that i is not equal to j, that one, okay, i runs from 1 to k, and then j has to skip 1 each time. So it has only k minus 1 steps. So we're getting k times k minus 1, and the denominator is still k times n squared. All right, so now we can cancel some k's, and I've been moving all the k's inside, so I'm keeping just the um, n square on the denominator, and then the k's all go at the top, so we've been canceling the k on the outside, and the k minus 1 turns into 1 minus k over 1. Now, this is the probability of having a collision in this particular point t. But we just want some collision. We don't care actually where we collide. We can collide at this point, this point, this point, this point, as long as we collide somewhere. So we can now sum over all n different choices of t, um, and that gives us an extra factor of n in here. So the probability that given those two points w and w prime, and we're getting a collision in the next step at some t, wherever this t is, is, well, the previous expression times n. So that means 1 minus 1 over k divided by n. Normally, if you have a fully random walk, if any other element is possible as the next element, then you could have a 1 over n chance. I mean, these two points each make a choice, and with one chance 1 over n, they pick the same point. So the probability has gotten worse of finding one by 1 over this number. So the probability before was 1 over n, the probability, sorry, 1 over n before, and now it's 1 minus 1 over k. So it's a little bit worse. And so the n in there changes to n, well, divided by 1 minus 1 over k, and that gets to this formula here, and that gets to the statement I had on the previous slide, namely that we need more steps by this extra factor. Okay, now we get a square root in there because the n ends up under the square root, and so the extra steps are by this factor. So, not huge for large k, but something to keep in mind when you're making your choices. Thing would not be complete if I wouldn't show you what Paul actually initially proposed. So these additive walks are what we're now using if you actually want to compute uh, the squeak logs. But if you, well, want to explain how it works or you don't have a simple example that works and you don't have gigantically many steps, um, doing 32 steps by hand is inconvenient. Teaching a computer to, to, to do 32 steps is no problem. Um, but doing it by hand is inconvenient. So if you only want something like three, then three steps would be catastrophe by this formula that I just showed you. We would be, well, delaying our collisions by a lot. And if you're actually trying to construct some examples, you should start feeling that. Now, the way that the schoolwork method avoids this issue is by having, okay, two steps, two normal steps here, and then well, one of them is a doubling. And actually, there's more weird in the schoolbook method. If you're starting with the idea that we just showed, namely that the steps choose C and D as random large integers, here they're just updating by 1. So for each point W that we're doing step from, we're wiggling just a tiny bit in the P direction or just a tiny bit in the Q direction. So the probability that we are colliding after this point, well, that requires that we have been almost adjacent before as well. It still works because we have these huge doubling steps, and if you look at what happens with the scalars, well, okay, if you just add p, we're increasing a by 1, b remains the same. If we're adding q, a remains the same, b increases by 1, and when we're doubling the point, well, then we're doubling both of the scalars, so we're getting 2a and 2b. And this combination of the doubling with the other ones means it's still okay. It is still a, a relatively weird thing. It's not what we normally would be doing. So um, it's a schoolbook method. You should have seen it, but this is not what you want to use in practice. This might be what you want to use for homeworks or exams or so on, but it's not what you really, really like. 
anyway, that's the end of it. Thank you.